Hello and welcome to the second ever EPP live stream. I'm very honored to have well, so many people watching and viewing. We are filming today from Kiev in Ukraine instead of the UK. So uh, maybe a bit more um, poignant for the topic that we're going to discuss today, which is uh, notably post-Soviet media and post-Soviet media's role now in European politics, which is coming to be more and more prevalent uh, in Western democracies and Western society. There are accusations going as far as to say that the media has collaborated in uh, rigging elections in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Germany, for example. So we will be speaking today with Dr. Richard Robin, who is a senior lecturer at George Washington University, who is very much an expert in the field of the uh, post-Soviet space and the Soviet Union. He was a frequent traveler to the Soviet Union when he was in uh, his student days and through his academic career. And he is an expert Slavic linguist as well, writing many books on Slavic linguistics and the role of the Russian language and Russian education. So he's very much uh, in a uh, good position to talk to us this evening. Um, again, I'm going to introduce uh, who we are and who our co-hosts are for this evening. So we are the European Policy Platform. We are a neutral and non-biased platform who offer uh, educational lectures from different academics and politicians from across Europe. Our goal is to democratize sorry, uh, European politics, to make it more accessible in this coronavirus era. All the same luxuries we've had with uh, in events with speaker events at universities, these will be luxuries that we will not have going on to the future. So we have to look for new platforms to host these events. And so now we're moving online and we're hoping to bring people in from all sides of the argument to create a constructive dialogue and to, um, to hopefully entertain. So I'd like to also thank today our co-hosts. We have quite a lot of co-hosts uh, for this event today. So I would like to, if, uh, excuse me, I'd like to give my special thanks to the London School of Economics Student Union Russian Business and Culture Society. I'd also like to thank the UCL Conservative Society, Edinburgh University European Union Society, and the University of, uh, College London International Relations Society, and also the Organisation of Slavic Studies at uh, Dr. Robin's home university of George Washington, and we give special thanks to them. So without further ado, um, we will bring on Mr... Richard Robin, can you hear us? Dr. Yes, I Robin? can. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine, thank you. Very well. So um, I thought I'd start a little bit by just asking you uh, if you'd give a little explanation about how, what your career progress was, what your area of expertise has been, and how you came to be interested in the post-Soviet sphere and the uh, and uh, Soviet ling um, Slavic linguistics even. Well, actually, my first um, exposure to Russian and to the world of Russian Soviet Union uh, outside of reading the newspaper uh, came uh, when I was around 11 or 12 years old and I got a shortwave radio and instant started, uh, started instantly listening to Radio Moscow, uh, of course, at that time in English. Um, which I found fascinating, even though the material was quite repetitive and boring. Um, and I've been following the Soviet media ever since. Um, my career path has actually taken me through Slavic linguistics, as you correctly noted, and uh, specifically an interest in uh, spoken Russian, Russian intonation, and the teaching of Russian language to American students. However, on the side, I have never lost my interest in the Russian media. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of the things that uh, I end up talking about a lot with an old friend of mine, John Byerly, who was the U.S. ambassador to Russia uh, in the late 80s and... Um, I take it back, the late, uh, the early 2000s um, was uh, our interest not only in media in general. Uh, my friend John was actually a radio announcer at a local station in Michigan when he was in college, but also in the way the media presents itself uh, in general and specifically in Russia. So uh, he and I will pick up on things all the time. Did they use this jingle or that jingle? Uh, were they using this camera angle or that camera angle? So, so to me, that sort of stuff is fascinating. And of course, it's come uh, to be a rather significant part of what I do now, now that everybody is interested in what the Russian media is doing outside of Russia. Mm -hmm. And would it be fair to say that the role of the Russian media from the Soviet Union to the Russian Republic today has greatly changed? Or would you say that it's just naturally evolved over its progress? I would say that uh, it is 
greatly changed in how it does things. Uh, it has not changed in its ultimate goals. However, uh, under the Soviet Union, the Russian media in the West was rather ineffective. Uh, it is certainly now more effective. I should mention that when we say, did it change radically, there's a little hook that we have to put in there. Uh, and that's the 1990s when the Russian media was, uh, if not extremely competent, at least free and open. Yes. And what was the cha the defining event of the 1990s? There seemed definitely, uh, of course, after the fall of the Soviet Union, but there was a key event, it seems to me, in the 90s, where the shift of the Russian policy towards using the media as less of a, of more of a, a branch of government to directly help its geopolitics. Do you see a, a discerning turning point in the 90s for this? Um, actually, I see it not in the 90s, not at all. I see it in the early 2000s once Putin came to power. Putin came mm -hmm. to power as uh, uh, on the eve of the new millennium. Uh, he was officially elected. He came to power as, as Yeltsin's appointee and then um, was elected probably legitimately. Those elections were probably fair and free. And uh, he was elected by a large margin, and uh, that happened in March of 2000. And since then, the Russian media has steadily come under more and more state control and influence. Um, it, start, it really didn't start until around 2003, three years after Putin had been in power. However, it's important to note that um, while the Russian media is largely under state influence, Putin is much smarter than the Soviets were about controlling the media. Uh, the communists felt that they had to control everything. Even candy wrappers were subject to censorship. Um, that's not true today. Uh, the Russian uh, government, uh, the Kremlin, is interested in s tightly controlling only those pieces of the media that are extremely popular. So if, you, if your television station is uh, widely watched, you will come under state control. If you run a dinky operation that has an audience of 15, say whatever you want. And why do you think when, especially in the, the fallout from the Chechen wars, why Russia sought to expand its media influence in Europe rather than dealing with dissent at home? It seemed to me that it instead focused on trying to dispel a different image of Russia or to create uh, unrest, as it would, in Europe rather than to fix its problems in its own backyard? Well, because I, I think that there's a logical reason for this. Keep in mind that the Kremlin, under the current administration, is essentially an opportunistic entity. I don't think that Putin has a grand plan going forth for the next 20 years or so. It is purely a series of opportunistic moves. And I think that what the Russians realized uh, after the turn of the millennium was that the chaos of the internet could be put to good use. And this is something that they had not thought of before. So if you were to look at Soviet propaganda, uh, keep in mind that there's no propaganda to speak of in the 1990s. There's no propaganda war, there's no information war. Uh, now it's true. The uh, Kremlin people are going to tell you, yes, there was an information war. The United States was was camp was was um, waging that war to weaken, to keep Russia weak and on its knees. And the current aggressive uh, Russian uh, fight back is precisely that. It's fighting back against this Western campaign. That would be the Russian point of view. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, there is no Russian participation in the information war uh, in Europe or America in the 1990s. Russia is solving its own problems. Then Putin comes into power. He is faced with the, the second Chechen war. And indeed, he has to fix it. And one of the ways to fix it is fixing the media at home because the media was unruly. They were reporting every, every time the Chechens uh, 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 sponsored some sort of act of terrorism, the media would be all over it, criticizing the response of the Russian authorities, which was always very clumsy. Well, Putin wanted to put an end to that clumsiness. So uh, during the Beslan school operation, when hundreds of uh, uh, people were killed, uh, as part of a botched rescue operation by the Russians uh, during the Nordost um, terrorist attack on a Moscow theater, uh, the media was very thorough in its coverage. And uh, this 
just just made Putin crazy because he felt that he had no control over his own storefront. That does not yet bring us into Europe. Uh, once Putin took care of his own media at home, he opportunistically realized, or his the people surrounding him opportunistically realized, because I, I should say that Putin at, at first was quite naive about the internet. He knew nothing about it. But he had people who were very confident. The Russians have always been good programmers. From the days when you couldn't own a computer, Russians still taught themselves programming and did a very good job of it. So uh, those people around him, uh, were able to convince him that there is an opportunity here to use the freedom of the internet in the West against the West and not put Russian fingerprints all over it. Now, of course, there are Russian fingerprints all over it. That's why you and I are having this conversation today. But the original thought was that that the Russians would, instead of creating a propagandistic campaign that says, this is Moscow speaking, as was the case in the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s, and the 80s, that this would be a stealth campaign not Moscow speaking, your own people speaking, funded by us. <laughs> and why, if we see this as a definite, if this is a strategy, if this is an arm of the Russian government, why do you believe that there is such a, why are they so successful? Why is Russian media so successful in Europe? And something that has always seemed very strange to me is the promotion of extreme ideologies for no apparent goals. For example, the far left and the far right will be very mm -hmm. much sponsored by Kremlin sources. Is the goal of this purely to create chaos and unrest, or is it part of an idea to try and foment political opinion? It is, it is precisely to create chaos and unrest. And I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, and that's the big difference between the Russian efforts in, in propaganda and trolling today and their propaganda efforts until, let's say, 1987, which is really the date that the propaganda war ended. The Cold War ended officially in, I think, 1991. But in fact, Russian propaganda towards the West had stopped by 1987 or so. Mm -hmm. um, Radio Moscow sounded very reasonable after 1987. But before that, there was this drumbeat message that had only one ideological arrowhead, and that was that communism is the wave of the future, socialism is good, um, and uh, anti-Soviet activities in the West are terrible. It was a very straightforward and ineffective message. Now they have the goal of not entirely uh, delivering pro-Russian propaganda. That exists, by the way, but that's a, a different operation. Mm -hmm. The operation that we're talking about uh, is designed to um, sow seeds of confusion in the West. Uh, is COVID-19 uh, getting worse or getting better? Uh, are efforts to combat it uh, uh, state overreach on the part of Western European states? Or, or uh, is it not state overreach? Both sides, of course, are taken. Uh, race relations also are supported on both sides. So yes, it is to create chaos, and it's a very logical thing to do, both from a historical point of view and from a practical point of view. Let's talk about history first. The Russian government is often says, and I believe that they are honestly convinced that the United States and Europe played a great role in uh, a media campaign against first the Soviet Union and then Russia and Russian unity and Russia rising from its knees in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. uh, they believe that the West was uh, behind uh, the um, Ukrainian antipathy towards Russia uh, and that the West organized both the various color revolutions of, uh, of Eastern Europe, the Arab Spring, all mm -hmm. of them. This is all Western attempts to sow <clears throat> chaos in the world. And one thing that the Putin government and most Russians in general, I would say, are really detest is chaos. There is this basic Russian fear, national fear, I would say, about chaos. Um, and uh, given a choice between harsh state control and chaos, most Russians will take chaos. And Putin will respond to that feeling. So they themselves are afraid of chaos. Well, they, if they're afraid of chaos, what better weapon against the West than, you guessed it, chaos. So yes, um, clearly there would be an effort to, so, and it's much easier to deal with a Europe that is in, embroiled in chaotic discussions with each other and various political factions fighting with each other than the United European Union. 
And if we take this for granted that this is a very pu commonly held belief, we know this is a, a media tactic, what is stopping Western society from taking decisive action against them? RT, Redfish and uh, Vesti um, have all quite a lot of influence in social media and in even on uh, traditional media in the United Kingdom, in Europe. Mm -hmm. Is there a danger in directly confronting this media? You know, your question, I think, uh, deserves two answers, two totally separate answers. I am not opposed to the Russian media having outlets, let's say called Radio TV Moscow mm -hmm. or Radio Sputnik, which is clearly a Russian operation. Um, if they want to, you know, we do the same thing. We have Voice of America from the United States, totally Not ineffective to propaganda arm. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there, you know, we, we sponsor all sorts of uh, um, other uh, radio, TV, uh, internet operations like Radio Marti to Cuba, which is specifically broadcasting toward Cuba. Every country has the right to, 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 to put up a billboard and broadcast, and every country has the right to spread propaganda. I have nothing against that. I believe that uh, that's part of a free world, free, free, free society, and state state-sponsored propaganda is, I, I believe, plays an actual legitimate role in, in that discussion. What so, so that doesn't bother me at all. And I could easily, I often go on Russian TV, uh, people say that when I do this, I'm just supporting the Putin propaganda machine, but I am providing an opinion that is not theirs. Perhaps I am contributing to the notion that their press is freer than it really is. But so be it. I am willing to engage in those discussions when all of the players are named and we know who they are and who they represent. What I don't like is when we see trolling in the internet and we don't know who the speakers are. Um, this bothers me a lot. To tell you the truth, Radio Sputnik bothers me a, a little bit because uh, even though they clearly are Russian, um, the, the word Sputnik, of course, means satellite and it's Russian. Uh, they don't have Russian guests on that show. It's no. all it, it's all people from various countries. It's usually native English speakers. Um, that has me a little bit concerned because, again, there's a little bit of disguising of what this is all about. What is Radio Sputnik's purpose? If their purpose is to promote a Russian agenda, I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. Every country has the right to do this. But if their purpose is to to do wedge politics without involving their own country, that bothers me okay. because it's it, it's the first it's it's that first step to trolling. Not quite there, but it's the first step to trolling. And, and yes, um, we should oppose. We should oppose. I'm not saying that we should uh, close down Radio Sputnik. No. Um, I'm not saying that we should shut down RT. Just the opposite. Let them speak. But mm -hmm. we should be uh, quite vigorous in our attempts to counter some of those, not only counter the arguments, but also examine very closely why they are having this host argue with this guest and why guests three and four were invited. Clearly, these are not uh, attempts to promote a straight Russian agenda. It's an attempt to confuse. And would you say, or on a journalistic point of view, that there are now two different schools. The, the, Russia has created its own Russian school of journalism, the way that things are done, the rule book, which is wildly different from ours. And do you see this as just a trait of the, the vestiges of the Soviet Union, or rather, is it a new school of thought which is being created in Russia? I, I think that Russia is taking advantage of the fact that the European press is very different from, the European media is traditionally different from the American media. Um, this has changed recently over the last 10 years because now we have extremely opinionated media. Uh, we have on the one hand Fox News, we have MSNBC, um, it used to be that, you know, like everybody else in the world, we had a few national networks, there was no internet, and mm -hmm. we, unless you were extremely conservative, you assumed that outlets like NBC, CBS, and ABC, they all pretty much presented the same sort of nondescript picture of the news. Yes. Uh, trying to spice it up as much as they could with the video. And if you take away the accent, they sort of sounded like the BBC. 
they they all sort of presented the same plate of news. This is not true in the rest of Europe. Uh, I, when when I talk about the rest of your the rest of Europe, uh, what I mean is uh, historically. So take a look at well, take a look at Britain. Uh, one can hardly if you compare the 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 rhetoric used in news stories in let's say the Guardian of 1990, before all of this Infowar stuff started. And the rhetoric or the news reporting of the Washington Post, now both of these are supposedly left-wing publications, but the Guardian de proclaims it from the skies. We are a left-wing publication and the Post does not, or did not. Mm -hmm. that, that might be changing now. Um, so in Europe, publications, media tended to wear its politics on its sleeve much more than the American media. Mm -hmm. And the Russian media continued this tradition once the Soviet Union fell and each publication could have its own political line. Believe me, they looked like the European press, not like the American press. Here it is. We, we are telling you the story because of blah, 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 blah. Then the state largely took over the media and continued that tradition, but this time with state stories going out. So do, do you see how that, 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 that had a natural um, progression? Because in Europe, and Russia followed Europe in its traditions, in Europe, journalists are much more opinionated. Now, you know that there's a Russian journalist who's often maligned. I happen to think that, um, I happen to respect him despite his checkered past. Uh, that's Vladimir Posner. And Vladimir Posner constantly says, you know, you should not be able to tell what a journalist's opinions are during an interview or during a news story. And he constantly praises uh, two American journalists or, or two American journalistic entities. One is Ted Koppel from ABC News from back in the 80s because he was often on his show. He could say, I could never tell whether Ted Koppel was a conservative or a liberal. Um, and uh, he really loves NPR. He goes on and on about how he loves national public radio, which, is, of course, is the American equivalent, I would say, of the BBC, if we have an equivalent of the BBC. Mm -hmm. um, international BBC, world, world, world news BBC. I'm not yeah. talking about internal BBC. So um, uh, if you look at, and, and uh, if he talks about Russia, he says, all of our opinion is under, is not journalism. It's state-controlled propaganda. And it comes from a very logical place. It, it comes from a place where even when this propaganda was entirely private, it was the opinion of whoever owned the media outlet. It was corporate censor uh, censorship. Now, America also has corporate censorship, uh, but mostly this is limited to cable stuff. Mm -hmm. And I guess the, the, the large question, one of the key questions is, and it's the word interference. Mm -hmm. Now, do you believe, or in your personal view, do you believe that the Russian media efforts are used directly to interfere with a democratic process? Or I do. It is, you do? I do. I do. Because and, again, so, okay, what, what is, the, what is the, the bedrock of Western society? Mm -hmm. Democratic liberalism. Kill it. Um, destroy it. Ruin people's faith in it. And mm -hmm. you get the exact result that the Russians are looking for. So would you say it's the attack on democracy is so much as to try to resort society to a more tribalistic view, to a more... It, precisely. You use the exact more... word that I would, would like to have used. It, mm -hmm. it pro promote tribalism. Look at Poland. Look at Hungary. The Russians have been very successful. Now, you know, the Russians put in their efforts there. Um, I cannot blame the Russians for the lurch to the right in those two countries. I think that that's, that stuff is native grown. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you want to say for the, if I was to play Devil's Africa as well, you, you said okay. yourself that um, the countries have the right to use their media influence in other countries. If we look at the United States, the United States certainly with uh, Radio Free Europe and Voice of America definitely tries to, I wouldn't say directly encourage the breakup, but try and encourage democratic movements within their own country. Would the mm -hmm. Russians reply with something similar that, that this is almost in their right to and that this is a defensive media action on their part. I, I believe that's correct. In other words, when we attack Russian trolling, and I do attack Russian trolling, it's one thing to attack and say, oh, oh, these terrible Russians, they're trying to interfere with our society. Well, there are two things to say here. First, 
I don't think that we were as nefarious in our methods as the Russians have been. Mm -hmm. But indeed, the, certainly American state-sponsored media. Um, and I think that the State Department tried to encourage emerging democracy in a whole bunch of uh, former Soviet republics. And the Russians hate that. This is their backyard. Just as uh, any American administration starts um, uh, blowing on the horn, screaming unfair, when the Russians start getting into Cuba. Well, they did that in the 60s, right? Now, uh, whenever there's an attempt to uh, get into Mexico, Venezuela, Central America, we start saying foul play because this is our backyard. Mm -hmm. and, and we're still very attached to the Monroe document, uh, doctrine from, from uh, two centuries ago. Well, the Russians have the same, same regional feelings. So I understand that entirely. Understanding doesn't mean condoning. It just means knowing about history. And if I was to write, if you believe, is Russia aiming for its backyard? Is it looking at its former territories? Is it looking towards Europe and influencing and disturbing there? Or has it changed? I've noticed recently the, the rise in Russian media in the Middle East, <coughs> how it has, there's a new direction, a new hold, especially in places like Syria, uh, Turkey. They very much shift their attention there. So would you see their greatest aim now being the large superpowers or the nations in their own backyard? I would say it's both. Uh, mm. I think that they are mo most worried about their own backyard and uh, uh, they're more panicked about that. Um, but they understand that who's been encouraging their own backyard to democratize? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> no, no doubts about who that is. So of course they're going to go after us. Yeah. And also in these state, in a lot of these states after the break of the Soviet Union, there is quite a large Russian uh, expatriate community living in, in Europe. And I find it very interesting to notice with the German elections, with the rise of the AFD, that the AFD specifically targeted in the east of Germany the diaspora of uh, Russian citizens. It was pr promoting propaganda in, in Russian language. And I've seen this influence... Uh, in other states, especially such as Estonia and Latvia, because they try, in a sense, to exploit the feeling of isolation. Would you believe that this is a tact this is a distinct tactic of the Russian state media to exploit the sense of the cultural isolation of Russian expatriate communities? Yes, but uh, different tactics and different um, methods, even different goals for different communities. Mm -hmm. So the Russian the Russian community in uh, the Baltics is not an expat community. It's a left behind community. And they feel very under attack, especially because in some of the Baltic countries, I would name Latvia in specific, um, <coughs> have, I think, taken an unfortunate path towards enforcing uh, linguistic unity. Um, it's one thing to insist that all right, from now on, the future generation of Latvian citizens, that is those holding Latvian passports, will have to learn Latvian, even if they are ethnically Russian. Mm -hmm. But it's another thing to say, all right, all of you Russians who have been living here ever since you were born in the mid 50s and who are you're now in your 60s. Now you've got to learn Russian if you want any state privileges, you want to vote, you want to. Well, come on. Um, no Western country does this. No democracy does this. What if we told, imagine the hue and the cry if in America we said no Spanish ballots, no Spanish legal notices. You get a parking ticket, pay it in English. You know, I think there are some Republicans who think like, like that currently. There are Republicans who think like that. But, <laughs> but even with the Republicans holding all three branches of government, uh, that did not happen. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I would say that uh, when a country like when a country tries to restore its linguistic integrity, and this is not only in the Slavic areas, uh, areas under Slavic influence. So you have the Baltics fighting the Slavs. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, look what happened in uh, Canada in the, in the late 1960s. Uh, you had Quebec feeling itself mm -hmm. very uh, under attack from Anglophone Canada, and uh, English was banned everywhere, you know, <laughs> don't speak English. Um, so uh, minority languages, when they come into power, tend to overreach, and mm -hmm. that's unfortunate because it gives the Russians a good excuse, and it makes those Russian populations 
if they supported Latvian independence, I know many Russians who supported Latvian independence in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And now they become nationalistic because the other side overplayed its hand. So that's that side. That's that's the Baltic side. But that doesn't cover Russian emigre communities in Europe and the United States. And there the 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 landscape is very different. You have people who left Russia because they didn't like living in Russia. They didn't like the political system of Russia. Um, they wanted to live in the West and be Western. Well, you know, Putin is not going to reach those people. They are anti-Putin. However, there are lots of Russians who emigrated, perhaps for economic reasons, perhaps for family reasons, perhaps because um, they were against the liberal Russia that was emerging under Yeltsin and that this was a chaotic country. I know many Russian immigrants who think that Putin is fine. I'm, I'm quite surprised about that. Uh, but, but in fact, I would add, I know many Russian conservatives who mouth all of, all of the stuff coming out of the Russian media about uh, how terrible chaos is and how terrible the yellow vests in France are and um, why Brexit is a good thing and um, basically the right wing in this country. Um, many Russian conservatives are in that camp. They claim to be against Putin, mm -hmm. but they're, they're touting all of his lines. Because keep in mind that while the Russian media in the West supports both sides to sow chaos, the basic Russian political philosophy that's given at home, that Putin has declared out loud, he did this in a, an address to, um, you know, he has a State of the Union address every year and usually goes on for several hours. Mm -hmm. And this was about three or four years ago where he said, the fact is that Russia will follow a decent and conservative course of known values. I mean, he sounded just like Margaret Thatcher in many ways. And would you say, if we're talking about the role of the Russian media, do you believe that the Russian media has a, has a use in a sense, in an academic sense? Is it a good measure, a good reflection of Russian society? Is it a good device with which to judge Russian society? Or is it rather a, a smoking mirror, a, a painted image over the view of Russia, which is given to the rest of the world? Both of those answers are correct. Uh, <laughs> it is a painted mirror. However, unlike the Soviet media, where you really had to read the tea leaves, you know, one out of place word and people say, oh my God, uh, or people would follow what was published in um, a, a newspaper called the Literary Gazette, uh, which was a weekly publication and probably the most liberal in the Soviet Union. And they look for the slightest little deviation from the party line. Well, we have plenty of that now. There's plenty mm -hmm. of deviation from the party line. Just yesterday on, Russia's Channel 2, uh, Channel, uh, uh, Canal Russia, uh, Channel Russia, um, they had um, a, one of their main talk shows, 60 Minutes, they had a, a, something like a minute-long clip from Alexei Navalny. This is unbelievable. Um, I, I, I could hardly believe my eyes, but there it was. They also uh, featured a whole bunch of other dissidents in very brief clips, which they then went on to rebut. But nevertheless, you would never see this kind of behavior in the Soviet press. And for that matter, you didn't see Navalny on, Russian, on a Russian screen ever before. Um, so the Russian press has its vagaries. Today, the Russian media has its vagaries. And you can see all of these eddies and currents. So yes, it's a very useful tool. But yes, it is window dressing. What's mm -hmm. even more interesting is the independent and opposition media, because there is an independent and opposition media. There's an independent media that is very careful about insulting the state, insulting Putin, or stepping on sacred cows. Yeah. But with outside of those um, restrictions, you do see serious discussion of issues in that media. So yes, that's worth reading. That's worth looking at. Um, also, there's the opposition media, of which um, there are a number of um, well-respected outlets. Now, of course, these people are always under government pressure, but they still exist. And um, it'd be nice if more Russians watched them. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, they occupy a place that I would say is pretty close to, well, in America, Pacifica Media. That's mm -hmm. probably even no Americans have heard of Pacifica Media. It's a, it's a left-wing radio outlet uh, that is uh, listened to by maybe a few thousand people, maybe a few tens of thousands of people, but it doesn't have millions and millions and millions of listeners. Well, that's the story with these Russian opposition media outlets. They're allowed to exist for the purpose of the Kremlin's being of CC. We, we have opposition, we're free, we have opposition media, mm -hmm. and because they don't have that wide an audience. And I would like to bring up in the subject of opposition media, mm -hmm. and I have to be careful what I say right now because of the, the certain household I'm in, but there are certain forms of media who are, very, well, are critical of the Russian government, but still receive funding from some of the same sources as some of the greatest proponents of the Russian line. And I wanted to understand how that came to be, that there is, I guess the word controlled opposition would be a bit too strong because these are still critical sources of the government. But it seems to me that a lot of the funding for all these medias have somewhat centralized into one body. Well, keep in mind that we could take um, if you talk to anybody at Echo of Moscow, where uh, your fiance's dad works, um, th they'll all tell you the same thing. We could be closed tomorrow. They're owned. They're owned by not the Russian government, but they're owned by commercial entities that are controlled by the Russian government. So yeah, they could be shut down tomorrow without any difficulty. There would be a hue and cry. I think that Echo of Moscow is with that pressure valve that they keep open because precisely because it is a pressure valve and it's a very good pressure valve. But um, I would uh, I would guess that if if the Kremlin really wanted to shut them down, yeah, you're right. They control that company and they could have that uh, that radio station shut down tomorrow. Uh, they did essentially shut down uh, TV Rain. You know, TV Rain was a cable channel. Mm -hmm. And the government just put pressure on all of the companies that advertised on it to withdraw their advertising. And uh, so TV Rain went off the cable, off cable because it didn't have enough commercial support. And now it's viewer supported on uh, the Internet mm -hmm. and their audience is quite, quite low. I think they're shooting, to tell you the truth, they're sort of shooting them in the, themselves in the foot because you have to pay a, uh, you have to, you have to pay to subscribe. And so um, foreigners yeah. can do that. But, you know, average yeah. Russian, how much are they going to pay to subscribe to an opposition channel? And on the other side of the coin, for the state-controlled media, which certainly doesn't try to risk being mm -hmm. offensive to the government, what degree of autonomy do these people get? Are they running stories in accordance with the government? Is it more Soviet style of this is the kind of acceptable content this is what you're published or are they given a degree of autonomy on a bond of trust as it were uh, they have a lot of autonomy mm -hmm. so uh un unlike i would say unlike the soviet union which was very top much more top down uh where each story was penned by government people looked over by government censors uh the levels the the amount of editing and censorship there, there were something like seven levels of it and the the actual censor's office was the the um very last office and by then there would never be any issue because all anything that could be possibly um objected to had been weeded out this is not the case with the russian media today um first of all they do a lot of live broadcasts and uh the soviets hated to do live broadcasting because you couldn't tell what was going to happen. I've been on live Russian broadcasts. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've even said some pretty embarrassing things on live Russian broadcasts. I'll, I'll tell you a, a funny story. I was on a broadcast from my office where I have a big picture on the wall. Uh, it's a famous picture of Brezhnev uh, kissing Eric Honecker, uh, the head of the PR, on the mouth. It looks like a French kiss. And uh, one of the hosts of the show that i was on noticed it in the background and they said oh that's a famous picture i said yes it was given to me by a colleague uh many years ago when the german and the slavic language departments were merged as a joke <laughs> and i said today when students see this picture they assume that it is a, 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 a an attempt at the support f at great gay propaganda mm -hmm. and the, the, the host who was 
interviewing me at the moment, her jaw dropped and she says, no, 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 no. I said, oh yeah, that's what they think. And I tell them, no, it's, it's a political history. But you, it, right then there was a moment of panic there because you know the, radio, the media does not want to encourage any positive views of gay people. And it's quite interesting to watch Russian media and especially in the home media for Russia, the narrative is radically different from from in Europe, and the agenda is is much less hidden. I remember watching with um, with Solovyev, uh, the the host of the I, you <laughs> have to forgive me the political talk show where they have um, their presidential debates, uh, yeah. it, the the open table format. Right. And if they have an American guest on, it's not the American guest is leave to expose himself, but the even the uh, reporters will interject to give the Russian version, give the Russian public's view on this figure. It's quite an interesting thing to see that there isn't much room for interpretation. The line That's is true. given and, and, by the media. And indeed, while I appear quite a bit on, on Russian TV, I would never go on Solovyov's program because you have no opportunity to say what you want to say. No. Um, I have been on programs where there have been attempts to manipulate what I'm saying, but I usually can stand my ground. But on Solovyov's program, I would never have a chance to do that. Let's say tomorrow there is a huge change in regime or there's a change in heart of the government. What what provisors would there have to be for the Russia to, to change its aggressive media detective? To, to stop trying to use the troll factories, to use his influence to, destable, to stabilize sorry, certain nations. What would be the conditions for the weakening of this uh, attempt? To have Russia as a strong geopolitical force uh, that has lost its inferiority complex and has lost its um, paranoia about the surrounding world um, and uh, have the rest of the world pretty much just forget about Russia unless they are paying homage in the sense in in the form of um, saying how beautiful Siberian winters are, you know, something like that. Uh, during the, um, of course, throughout Russian history, Russia has a reason for its paranoia. Mm -hmm. It's constantly invaded over its thousand year history. It gets invaded again and again and again. Um, in America, of course, we don't get invaded uh, because we've, up till now, the two oceans have uh, kept us from being invaded. Uh, but the Russians have not been so lucky. Mm -hmm. And that has created a huge, A, paranoia and B, inferiority complex. And I think that that, to a large extent, is what drives Russian foreign policy. And if we look as well on the health of Europe, do you see any attempts to copy this new Russian control of the media? Because certainly for some states, this unparalleled control of media sources, this unparalleled control of the message which is given out from your country to the rest of Europe is certainly very attractive. So do you see any nations which are starting to look towards Russia as an example for press freedom or lack of? You know, I've uh, yes, uh, I think that we see Places like Turkey and a uh, number of countries in Eastern Europe, uh, well, you know, any any authoritarian regime is they all pretty much look alike. Now, I I use the famous distinction that um, Ambassador K uh, Kirkpatrick used back in the 1980s, uh, the UN Ambassador Kirkpatrick, Jean Kirkpatrick. There's a difference between authoritarian regimes and totalitarian regimes. Um, I don't think that outside of North Korea and possibly Cuba, we have any, maybe Venezuela, we have any totalitarian regimes left. Uh, we have lots of authoritarian regimes left, and Russia is one of those, and I think that Poland and Hungary are quickly becoming those, Turkey is one of those, and so on and so on and so forth. So I'm not sure that these authoritarian regimes are borrowing from Russia or looking to Russia as an inspiration. Authoritarian regimes do what they do. They, they you know, there's a natural way for them to behave. So you don't see it as Turkmenbashi borrowing from Vladimir Putin, uh, um, the leader of Belarus is looking to if Russia. Anybody's borrowing from anybody. You know, Putin, who decided to. Uh, create this new position to do this constitutional reform and make himself uh, president for life after having decided, well, maybe I won't be president for life. Maybe instead I'll be supreme leader for life or supreme advisor for life. Well, where did he get that idea from? China. That came from Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. Yes. 
uh, where Nursultan Nazarbayev retired, mm -hmm. named the capital after himself, yes. and, and then promptly went on to become supreme national spiritual advisor. That was the model that Putin was going to follow. So who's inspiring whom here? All in all, the Russian media is more and more attractive to many citizens across Europe because Russian media is associated with even the rebellious spirit. The Russian media portrays itself as the alternative voice, the voice of the people, the voice of... Think deeper. The, Think deeper. That's the RG. Deeper. The, the, the oppressed man. The yeah, yeah. Is this symptomatic of a Western failure or is this a Russian capitalization on external factors like war, break up of certain countries no, or is this a Western failure? I think yes. it's a Western failure. I don't know that it's a Western government, governmental failure. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe, you know, given my feelings about uh, our current president, I could say, yes, this is a, or, or for that matter, the, the, uh, EU, the um, UK president, although I don't think that he has been lax on uh, Russian trolling. He's very opposed to Russian trolling, but mm -hmm. in general, the European turn to right-wing solutions is a failure and one that invites in this kind of um, interference from the Russians. I've also noticed there's a, t a tendency on the national populist front, it seems the Russian media profits on this, the idea that Russian agents even in the United Kingdom with the Salisbury poisonings, uh, poisonings by polonium, actions against uh, distant figures and Russian citizens in European soil, they're played off. They are not, they are minor incidents in a larger picture. And it's the same way with Donald Trump's presidency, this national populist uh, wave of, it doesn't matter if you look at the small incidents, we're in a big project here. Do you see this national populist wave as an attempt to align Europe and allow, kind of give a cover screen, a smoke screen to some of the actions of Russia in Europe? I think that's true, and I think that uh, indicative of that is the fact that things like assassination attempts under in Soviet times were really rare. Now, there was a famous, uh, you probably, you may know about the, uh, the Bulgarian attempt against uh, the Bulgarian journalist Markov, yes. inspired by the Soviets. They killed him on a London street by a poison pill umbrella. Mm -hmm. But this, this this became a major incident. I think that the other big uh, Soviet Soviet era attempt was on the life of the Pope. Um, uh, probably that was a Soviet effort. Again, again, masterminded through Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. But these incidents have become more common uh, under the current Russian administration, and that bothers me a lot. I think that they are looking to be able to pull this stuff off a lot more. And it used to be that um, when there was a bipolar world, the KGB and the CIA had rules of engagement, and you could pretty much tell what was going to happen. Now we don't have those rules of engagement anymore, and mm -hmm. things have become more chaotic. Um, I think what we'll do now is I'm going to talk uh, just a little a few things that I, I forgot to mention uh, in our intro. Mm -hmm. Firstly, is our funding for our organization. So I, I speak directly to the audience here in saying that we are run purely off donations to cover the costs of inviting um, our lovely speakers and for hosting uh, these webinars. So I'm going to flash onto the screen very, very quickly um, our PayPal. Oh, it seems to have. There we go. Uh, our PayPal link where you can donate as little as one pound. And it really, really, really does help us in keeping up inviting uh, quality speakers and uh, paying off the costs of our, our running fees. Um, I'm going to now also throw it open to some questions from the public. We've had some very, very interesting questions. And I do encourage you, even as we're reading some of these questions, to please leave more questions in the comments and we will get around to them. Um, so I'm going to let my um, co-worker choose and put up onto the screen uh, one of the comments for us to look at. Or uh, I will, the oh. only thing I want to warn you about is that in, oh, the next, in the next oh half hour or so, I might be getting interrupted by uh, some oh. people from RTVI, a Russian TV station, because I'm supposed to go on there at, at five. They uh -huh. might want me to do a sound check. Okay. Well, so. um, 
20 minutes, I think, tops is what we'll be. Oh, okay. So we'll, we'll power through them. So I'll, I'll read the sound out for you. Okay. Do you think the Russian propaganda machine is as powerful as it is due to the very polarizing nature of online culture and the whole culture war found online? I've noticed that confirmation bias plays a large role in the proliferation of fake news. Absolutely. Short answer. Absolutely. Yes. I like that one. Uh, let's have one from Matthew Zimmerman. Uh, how does the American media's politicization of Russia, especially in regards to the 2016 election, influence the narrative Russian media has on America? <laughs> well, the Russians always make fun of the fact that we believe that they influenced the 2016 election. Uh, there was an interesting incident about maybe two years ago when for an April Fool's joke, the Russian embassy, and the Russians don't play April Fool's jokes, but the Russian embassy on April Fool's, this was maybe two or three years ago, um, put on their answering machine a message where you called them up and you would say, for Russian hackers to interfere with your website, press one. To uh, interfere with the results of your next election, press two. So, you know, clearly this is something that they like to talk about and um, play off of. Well, of course, they deny it. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll go to the next question, if possible. Uh, oh, this is from the president of the LSC uh, Russian Business and Culture Society, which I, I thank them for their co-host. And they'd like to ask, what is your opinion on Ivan Golunov's uh, fabricated case last year? Do you think similar things are likely to happen in the future to other journalists? Um, I, I want to understand the question correctly. Uh, are there going to be more cases where a person is arrested and then let go uh, because the state has said that uh, it oh, made a mistake, didn't mean to do that? Or, uh, or that there will simply be more arbitrary arrests. I believe the arbitrary part. <laughs> right. That will continue to happen. And, you know, if, if you have friends in high places, you get off. <laughs> hmm. Exactly. Uh, and, and what's interesting is that, you know, you get arrested by an overzealous uh, prosecutor. And then it turns out, oh, mistake, shouldn't have done it. Uh, we have a question from Carolina now. Um, do you have any recommendations whatsoever about how to counteract these ne negative influences on Western media and the resulting polarization? More of a cultural question. I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, I'm very good at suggesting ways to counter Russian state propaganda that is open and that says, we are Russia, this is what we believe. That's, that's easy. So fire with fire or not fire with fire? Um, you mean, should we go trolling ourselves? Well, you know, Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. There are pluses and minuses to it. Uh, you get caught. It's a minus. We'd probably get caught. Um, Do you think there's any evidence of that already happening? Do you reckon the behind the scenes in Washington, that's something that's a reality? If, if I worked for the administration, I would probably be suggesting ways to do it. Whether it's a good idea, I don't know. One can argue, well, it's, it's immoral, it's not right. Well, states don't act on the basis of morality unless it's big, big M morality, mm -hmm. like six million people getting killed, okay? Two million people in Cambodia killed, suddenly big M morality. But for stuff where people aren't actually shedding blood, States don't have much in the way of big M morality. You know, we bugged uh, uh, Angela Merkel's phone and, oh, okay, we got caught. Ah, ah, too bad. Uh, we have a familiar face now asking a question. Um, what does Professor Robin think about Sabranevkov's uh, court drama today? Will artists in Russia continue to be pressured more and more as they become more open to criticize and bite the government? Uh, was him being let go a sign that it's a warning? Why did they let him go? Uh, they, did they not suspend his sentence? I, I might have the story wrong. Um, I don't have that story as well. I, I'll, I might bring on the person who asked that okay. question very quickly to, to ask you, uh, Betha. Uh, hi. <laughs> did he get a three editor, editor here? They wanted to serve him six years in colony. Instead, what they gave him was uh, uslovna. So, yeah, hey, a, you're a criminal, but, you know, yes, that's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that that trick will be used more and more and more. There's a reason to use it. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a legal reason to use it. Um, when you give somebody a suspended sentence, you have nevertheless convicted them, and that means that you have a criminal record. 
in, in most Western countries, a criminal record doesn't stop you from doing a lot of things. In Russia, a criminal record stops your entire public life. You're done. Mm -hmm. I've, I asked this question to Ilya Ponomarev, and he gave me a response that, that this wasn't the case. But in my personal observation, I see in Russia a look looking east, an eastward looking nation, which is now looking to the Chinese hard power, the Chinese control that they have on society. I think this is reflected quite nicely in they, the... They've been looking that way for the last 20 years. When Putin looks across the border, across the Black Aviation's crossing at China, he sees the kind of country he would like to have. Exactly. So what do you believe the next steps? If you were, if you were in Putin's shoes and you were looking to solidify your, not just your media control, but your geopolitical control, what do you believe the next steps we could see are, especially mediatically in, uh, in that sphere? The next steps are steps that will not be taken um, because I don't think that Russia is in a position to take them. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason that China is a geopolitical rival and threat is that their economy is so successful. Um, you know, uh, China in uh, the... 1970s had no world economy and therefore you didn't hear anything about China. Mm -hmm. uh, China is the second biggest economy and if we were to have, um, there would be large economic fallout if a cold war with China uh, went, went south. Russia doesn't have that leverage. They have oil and gas and that oil and gas works only for Europe. Um, we don't buy any Russian oil and gas. Uh, we have a surplus of oil and gas at the moment. Um, and uh, with no, nothing but raw materials to sell, how is Russia going to threaten to disrupt the world economy? Mm -hmm. So without that economic leverage, without that ability to say, oh, sanctions, you know, what do you do? So I, I think that if Putin were smart, he would find some way to diversify the Russian economy. But to diversify the Russian economy, you would have to give up oligarchic control over all of the industry of Russia. Mm -hmm. And if you did that, why would you want to be Vladimir Putin? And um, we have a question from Dylan Peter, who I believe is from uh, the OSS at uh, George Washington University. He says that he studied Russian last he studied Russia sorry last summer, and both teachers and students spoke openly and critically about Putin and the Russian government without fear of the FSB busting down the door. However, there was a lot of concern over a more recent bill that criminalized online criticism of the government on social media platforms. If you know about this bill, could you elaborate on the specifics of this bill and do you worry about the standard this bill sets for possible censorship laws down the road? I do worry about the bill uh, ever since Russia threw off communism in the late 1980s. Uh, since the year 2000, I correct myself, 2003, 2004, there have been more and more media restrictions, not only by buying up corporations and controlling the media that way, but also putting legal restrictions on the media. So this is just one of a, this latest is just one of a series. So the first was really that, uh, this was back in the mid 2000s when suddenly it became illegal to criticize incumbents directly. You could not criticize other political candidates directly. Mm -hmm. You could criticize policies, but you could not poke a finger at the candidate themselves. So this was a very important restriction on freedom of speech. Um, and it's gone on that way since then, little by little chipping away at these at, uh, at absolute freedom of speech by saying you can't say this, you can't say that. And this is just the latest. So I'm not I'm not surprised. It's true that there is no fear anymore of telling a joke that's going to have the, the FSB or back then the KGB or the NKVD knocking down your door, as was the case with Alexander Solzhenitsyn in the late 1940s when he wrote a joke about Stalin to a friend in a letter and that got him arrested and sent to Pula. Um, that, that sort of thing would never happen. People can criticize Putin in private as much as they want. And that used to be criticizing the criticizing Brezhnev. By the way, that also used to happen in private, but among good friends. Uh, you would not want to criticize Brezhnev in front of strangers because you never knew what sort of strangers might be listening in. Yes. Um, however, today, 
certainly there's no fear in criticizing Putin among friends, in private, mm -hmm. even on the street, even among people that you don't know. However, uh, to make direct criticism uh, of Putin on wide distribution television, wide broadcast television, nothing's going to happen to you. You might not get invited on that channel again. You might be banned from, from TV, from federal channels on TV. Uh, but, but we're not talking about a Stalinistic Russia. We are not even talking about a, a Khrushchevian or Brezhnev Russia. Do you see we're that as even a possibility? Is this a, is this a step too far? Is this an exaggeration that they would, Russia would never go in that direction? Or is well, it not at that stage? Never say never. <laughs> never, say never. No. Um, could there be a Stalin coming after Putin? I'm not saying that that's going to happen. No. But it's not outside of the realm of possibility. Because in a million years, in a million years, I would ne have never imagined that someone like Donald Trump would be elected president of the United States. So that just proves that anything can happen. So I don't want to make those predictions. And I've been really bad about my predictions uh, in Russia. Should, can we do a final question, if that's all right yeah, with you, Robin, sure. if you've got enough time for a final yeah. question? Uh, we have one from uh, Unik, who says, uh, how does Russia influence the Balkans? Is it doing much to heighten tensions between Balkan countries like Albania and Serbia? The answer to that is yes, and uh, I would throw in a caveat, I don't know much about the Balkans. Uh, clearly, uh, there's a dynamic that needs to be understood, which is that Russia feels a great bond with the Slavic populations of former Yugoslavia and Bulgaria. The Russians, mm -hmm. the Russian army freed Bulgaria in 1878 from the Turks. So uh, there's a good deal of friendship between the Bulgarians and the Russians on a person to person level. Uh, the Russians strongly supported the Serbians who are uh, Orthodox believing Cyrillic writing Slavs as opposed to the Albanians who are largely Muslim and uh, speak a language that's not even Slavic, mm -hmm. much less use a Cyrillic. So um, yes, of course there is that uh, division. And it was, we saw this in the 1990s in Kosovo, uh, where uh, we had a Muslim uh, breakaway region that the Russians uh, did not want to support independence for, and in fact supported uh, the Serbians who ended up being tried in, in The Hague. And this was, by the way, not only a government initiative, most regular Russians that I talked to outside of the small circle of cosmopolitan liberals in Moscow, most of the normal Russians that I talked to felt a great deal of support for the Serbians and a great deal of kinship and couldn't understand why American generals pushing buttons in some military base were having bombers drop bombs on, on mm -hmm. uh, Serbian troops. I certainly understand this, but there was an incident, uh, you might know something more on this than I do, about the Russian influence even in, in Montenegro, if I believe it's right, they had elections there which were severely uh, influenced by the Russian media and the Russian government, and I believe that caused quite a, uh, a hoo-ha over there as well. I don't know if... Um, I, you know. I can only tell you that, you know, this Russian fear of chaos, as I say, they, they want to promote chaos in the West, but Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia, is a very touchy thing because mm -hmm. you promote chaos there and you end up with NATO planes bombing parts of uh, essentially a former backyard. Uh, on the other hand, you leave chaos, chaos run run wild and you don't know what's going to happen because Yugoslavia is such a difficult place. Mm -hmm. So I think that Yugoslavia is a particular puzzle for the Russians. Well, I'm going to let a little bit of time. If anybody wants to post a, a final comment into the chat, um, I will allow that. I'll give it a couple of seconds. If there are no further questions, then I will thank uh, Dr. Robin for his time. It's been a very enlightening lecture and I hope we can have you back oh, it was a pleasure again to, sometime in the future. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to again um, talk about the funding of our organization. Any donations that you can uh, muster up, be it one pound, one euro, one dollar, whatever your home currency is, it does generally help us. Uh, we are a completely not-for-profit organization. We're registered in the United Kingdom. We're a registered company um, and we run purely off uh, of donations and your support. So I will leave this on the screen as uh, we say goodbye to uh, Richard Robin and I thank you all for tuning in today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.